Good afternoon, everybody. It tells me I'm live. Now, the observant of you will see I'm not in the workshop today. I've uh, just up or let the computer update itself and uh, it doesn't want to play ball. So I've come indoors and rather than disappoint all you guys, I will do a question and answer. If that's okay with you, if not, um, I am sorry, but there's nothing I can do. Uh, computers and me don't see eye to eye, but uh, that's the best I can do today. So um, I'm here. Welcome to everybody. If you drop out, I do apologize for not uh, doing anything special today, but I will get it sorted out later on. Um, so if there's any questions, ping them up and I will try and answer them as best as I can. So looking at the chat, there's quite a few of you in. Um, Mike Hugh was in first, followed by Tommy's workshop. Let's see if I can just scroll down them. Duncan, the demon barber. Mark Pritchett, SK Craft, Steve was in, but uh, he's gone to do some work. He was going to earworm for me today. So it was a thank you to him, but uh, a cheerio, because he's got some doors to go and finish sorting out. So he's going to do that. Colin Izzard is in. Um, Pete from Twisted Trees. Ian Leonard, Richard RKJ Spinningwood, Mark the Gentleman Woodturner, Doug Miller, John S, Gav Sade work, Woodwork, Quite a few there. Robert Dolman, Barry Chitty. So for the, the last few of you that have just popped in, I'm not in the workshop today. Unfortunately, the lathe's done a, uh, the computer's done an upgrade and it doesn't want to play ball. So you've got me in here and I'll do a question and answer or answer what I can, um, or you go and do a bit of turning yourself. <laughs> I am sorry, but uh, rather than leave you in the lurch, uh, um, I'll, I'll sit here face to face and answer any, any questions you put up on the screen. And at the moment, there's none coming. Everyone's just chatting to each other, which is good. Now, any, any turning related questions that you have, I will see what I can do. Or pass my opinion on, or the way I would do it, not necessarily the way everyone would do it, but we're all different. Hi, Hodge. So you've just come in. Gav had a question. Where, where was that? How about that then? If you're colouring wood, what is the routine? I.e. do you seal first, etc. Gav, what are you going to use for the colouring? Are you going to use um, acrylic paints or stains? Acrylic paints being wood-based, 
I would tend to seal the wood. Put a sanding sealer on, go over it with 400 grit or a Webrax pad just to denib it before you start applying the colour. The colour won't penetrate quite so deep. It will work quite well. Um, if you're doing stains, you really want them to go in to the wood, which is what they're made for. In that case, you won't, or I wouldn't, seal the wood. Depending on the quality of the wood, whether it's a hardwood, softwood, punky wood, whatever it is, you might need to seal before you put a stain on. If it's really punky, just to hold it together before you finish sanding. Um, there's no specific answer to this, but that is the broad answer. You can, you can always try your own method. This is the method that most of us would use. say um, anything with water in it will tend to lift the grain so you need to minimize the grain lifting you don't want to basically um, paint your wood emulsion the wood whichever way you want to um, pronounce it say it it's all wood it's all water related um, as soon as you try to break that the wood back down again to a smooth surface you've either got to recoat it again because you've taken quite a bit of it off so um that's what i would do anyway so hopefully that answers your question gav and i see wyvie's andrews joined us so just to update andrew and anyone else that's new to it, um, I'm in the I'm in the office at home. Computer's gone tits up in the workshop, so uh, it's this or nothing. So we've had one question. I'm taking questions today, and I'll do them as they come up. If I if I miss one, put it up again. So Mark Pritchard is asking for any young people interested in turning. Do you think you could make a living from it? Um, not specifically from turning, I don't think. You've got to put teaching, tuition, and possibly another string to your bow on there as well. Unless you can get gallery work and you've got a very good name for yourself, which comes with time, um, I would say no, unless you can get property that, or something to rent that is free, electricity, which is basically free, um, wood, which is basically free. You might be able just to break even on that, but you're not gonna, not gonna put, a, put the pension pot very high on the list, I'm afraid. Most of us in here are hobby turners and it is just that with um, with us doing shows, club bits and pieces, um, to make make ends meet, pay pay for the new tools that we need, um, buy bits and pieces that we don't need. Question from Richard: Can you use rapeseed oil instead of tongue oil? I think you can. What you need to be careful of with using oils is that they don't go tannic. I mean, rapeseed oil is a pure oil. Is it pure crushed rapeseed oil and strained, or has it had um, additives put in it to prolong its life? I would certainly read the bottle 
and read up on it. I honestly don't know that one. I've used called, um, sunflower oil for salad bowls without a problem. But you just need to make sure it's not going to go tannic because the last thing you want is a customer bringing it back and saying, oh, this is horrible. Doesn't do you any good. And it doesn't do the rest of us any good. Barry's Wood Creation says, yeah, sorry I'm a bit late. I should think so, Barry. But uh, you're, not, uh, you're not missing a lot at the moment because we're just doing a question and answer because my, lay, my computer in the workshop has decided to upgrade and not want to play ball. So if you like to type in a question. What's Barry put on there? I, I Mark put on there. I find what I sell, I put back in the workshop pace for my hobby of turning. Exactly, Mark, that's that's all I'm doing. Um, you certainly want, wouldn't want to leave it for a retirement and think you're going to put your pension pot in. And Pete's put in the rapeseed will go rancid in time, but it can be washed off regularly and reapplied. If that's the way you want to to work it, um, Pete, that's fine, but um, you've got to rely on the customer if it's a sold piece or it's a giveaway doing what you've asked and we're still coming back and saying, oh, it smells funny. You wouldn't, uh, again, going back to the rapeseed oil, I don't think any one of us would want um, the, the health police coming round and saying you're using something and someone's got poisoned or gone down with a, an allergy of sorts. I, like I say, I know rapeseed oil is straight off the, uh, off of the ground locally and, and crushed, so it should be good, but... Um, just be careful. Duncan, I'm about to try turning some freshly felled timber. Are there any difference in tool presentation that I need to consider as I'm only used, only used to use in dry blanks for turning? Uh, it, all turning should be exactly the same. Bevel on, bring the cutting edge into play and cut with the tool as a cutting tool and not using it as a scraper. Um, softwood, freshly felled timber, depending what it is, cuts a lot easier. So the tendency is that you might tend to use your sharp tool a lot longer in blunt mode before sharpening it but you can certainly tell when you, you've you got a sharp tool on there, the stream has just come straight off. Apart from that, um, depends, are you going, are you considering turning it to a finished item or are you consider turning it so that it dries quicker? Um, both are different. If you're turning it to a help it dry depending on the diameter of the bowl i'm assuming you it, you were talking about a bowl because that's what it normally is a bowl or a hollow form you need to allow for it to go oval because it will it always tends to dry two ends better than four ends together so um Allow it to allow enough in that so that when you remount it, and also I tend to make my mortise, and I always use a mortise if I'm using green wood because you've got more strength in that. But always make your mortise tight ish to the 
chuck you're using and then when you need to remount it you can reverse it and always pip the center and then when you remount it you can use the pip and you should have enough then to true it up to fit still fit your jaws without stretching them too far out of safety if you're turning to turn it finished you will need to go down to something like one and a half two mil wall thickness so that it all dries fairly quickly and that includes some of the the base as well so you don't want to uh, you know three mil walls two three mil walls and um 25 30 mil base because you'll end up with too much stress in the base hodge it's getting a bit cold here in texas tough is there a recommended plug-in type heater for the workshop nothing that I could recommend in the way of brands or the like. What I would be careful of is using um, propane or gas heaters in the workshop because the airborne dust can get into them and you get a second reignition of a uh, fireball. So I would say don't use freestanding propane gas heaters in your workshop because of the danger that is in, involved um, any thermostatic electric blow heater if you wanted to leave something plugged in all night um, definitely a thermostat on it otherwise the uh, electricity bill would be exorbitant Pete put in. Personally, I avoid using any vegetable oil, especially on sold gear. I have experimented for stuff in the kitchen, but as you say, once out of your hands, you can't control the maintenance. Exactly, Pete. Um, the only reason I've used um, sunflower oil on the salad bowls was because, and I did put a proviso with it that. Uh, once they've been wiped out several times, you will need to go back over them again. And don't use olive oil because that goes rancid very quick, apparently. But, uh, it's worth telling people. If they listen, that's good. If they don't listen, well, it's, uh, it's entirely up to you. Out of your control. With wet wood. Um, it's for my daughter, Hodge. What's Doug saying? I'd say any electric heater that is large enough for the space should be fine. Exactly. Um, I would think you'd want a blow heater, Doug, because uh, you'll circulate the heat easier. You can always turn it off when you start sanding so you don't get to, don't recirculate the dust. I should say she doesn't like the smell of tongue oil lemon oil is perfectly safe that i believe is um, a food safe oil it can be used on anything it can be waxed over as well once it's once it's dried for 24 ish hours so definitely definitely lemon oil is not an issue Jigsy, I have an electric oil field heater in mine. Ideal. You can leave that on all the time. You can set the thermostat on there and not worry too much about it. Pete's the same. No dust moved and can put it under the lay to keep the legs and hands warm. You move faster, Pete. Don't bloody sleep there. If you're an Ikea and you get a bottle of their mineral oil it's only about four pound yeah um that or you can um 
butcher's block oil is another one which is totally food safe if the butchers can use it on their cutting blocks i would think that is as good as anything so um mineral oil sometimes has dryers in it so just be a little bit careful on that um, but as far as i'm aware butcher's block oil um, ebay it is not that expensive um, i think it's totally pure whatever it's made of and it's not dead butchers apparently right what's the last one have you food so far from chestnut products for my products projects yeah uh, um, if it says food safe on it um and it's and it's chestnut particularly chestnut products i know um governor i can't think of his name terry has got all the certificates if you ever need them he can email them over to you so you can print them off so all of their products that say food safe are food safe be a little bit careful on some of them that are the, the more of the back street ones is uh, whether they can substantiate what they put on the bottles which is block oil is pure mineral oil can be picked up from any chemist says it can be used medicinally yep and they also feed mineral oil to horses don't they if they got colic i believe i'm not a horse lover but uh, as such but uh, it's funny what things you can pick up that's the bottom of my chat at the moment so come on guys stick us another question in or we'll get me to elaborate on something that we've already gone over Mark saying you have to check some have nuts in. Well, if it's walnut oil, um, I think that's self explanatory. So you just obviously need to check with your customer if you're using, for argument's sake, walnut oil, that uh, they, they haven't got a nut allergy. Tommy, I would uh, suggest the same to stick with what finishes say that they're food safe. And if, if like I say, if necessary, you can uh, you can always ask Terry if it's chestnut, he will forward the food safe um, certification. That's cost him a lot to get everything tested. So it's worth using them and, and I always push them as well. Most of my finishes are chestnut. Like I say, I'm not affiliated to him. I can use whatever I like. But at the end of the day, I'd rather put something on that I know I'm not going to get a customer coming back and saying, oh, this stinks. What oil did you use on it? I don't know. It come from Tesco's or wherever. So think of where you're selling it or who you're giving it to. You don't want grief. Hi Lewis. So you've you've crept in. And for those that have just crept in, um, it's question and answer today because I don't have a computer in the workshop. It's decided to uh, throw a wobbly. What's Pete put on there? There is a nut holding the chisels in my, my workshop, so if you have an allergy, then best avoid it. Well, yeah, I think that's why we all have workshops, Pete. Us nuts have got to live somewhere. Gives us something to do, though, doesn't it? Keeps us out of the pubs. And 
Mark says you get what you pay for. Um, not all the time, Mark. You can't you can't guarantee the safety of some of the stuff on the market. It might be a few pence cheaper, but you can't you still can't guarantee. I've I've seen some dubious stuff that's even dearer than um, cemetery stuff. And as for, um, got to be careful how we say this, but there's quite a few Americans make their own finishes. Just be aware of what you're putting on the wood. Come on, people, throw me a question. Right, or I'm going to ask you what what projects is everyone working on up to Christmas then? Don't forget we've got uh, a few days spare that we can do nothing apart from play in the workshop. Have you played with the forge skews as signed by Colwyn Way? Thinking I want one. We're not holding one before trying to buy. I haven't. I've seen them. I have held one. Um, my personal thought on that, Pete, and it is purely my personal thought, is that as they're, they're tapered, they start off about an inch at the top and taper down to uh, about three eighths at the bottom. The more you sharpen them, the smaller the skew is. Um, I wasn't over impressed with them. If they work for you, good. Um, like you say, do you want to spend a lot of money before, before buying one or before deciding that you don't like it? Then you can sell it, but uh, you won't get what you paid for it. I, I much prefer the parallel shafted skews and I have a preference for the radius cornered ones, not the square cut corner ones. That is, it makes it for me a lot easier to roll the skew and it doesn't, the square ones I find dig in the tool rest. So as soon as you've used a square tool and a sharp cut cornered one, you've got to think about, have you got a little nick that you're gonna get a tool caught up into? And particularly if you've got a skew, that's the last thing you want to do. Try running it along the tool rest and you're just jumping in the nicks. It would be like riding a piece of corrugated paper. Speaking of nuts, I turn the globe of an Xmas ornament for from a Banksia pod. Do you have a recommended finish for those? Well, from Banksia pods, you probably want 30,000 uh, lastoplasts where it's flown off and uh, bitten you, the bits and pieces. Depends how you want to finish it. You can finish Banksia any way you like. It's no good putting on um, Yorkie grit. It's no good putting on a wax. You'll end up picking it all out, picking it out of all of the holes. It's got to be a spray on finish. Whichever spray on finish you want. Um, I can't think there's gonna be a difference. It's how you want it, whether you want it satin, matte or gloss. And don't forget if, you, if you've got gloss on, you can always buff it, rub it back to uh, to get a mat What's that one? Okay. Right. Okay. Chat's so small on here, the only way I can see it is to bring it up on the screen. Oh, the French one's in. Hello, Baz. How are you breathing this morning? Okay. Not upset too many people.
and two clocks, then bowls. Sorry, I missed the missed the start of that, Mark. What did you? All right, okay. Mark's doing twenty potpourri pots with metal lids. Stick some up as pictures in Mark, so that we can see. We all like a good laugh. Let's see why you should be the only one that doesn't get a laugh out of it. You know, projects on here are good. It gives other people something to talk about and discuss. We all see things and do things differently. Douglas Mungham's in. Hi, Douglas. Baz is chuckling because he knows I hit the truth. Then I think, yeah, I would. I would say um, put put pictures up. Put the odd picture up. Not every picture up, but put the odd odd few pictures up of what you turn, and ask for comments, and expect some really bad ones, and expect some that aren't the truth. If you have got an issue with um, someone's turning rather than broadcast it right across Facebook or whichever platform you use it's a lot easier to private message them and it saves them hiding in the background because they've been embarrassed and exactly the same at um, wood clubs um, discussion the other night about whether you leave in or take out the chucking recesses and or, or tenons. My first and only club um, competition I entered, I left the mortise in the bottom, got absolutely slated for that, and then he tore it apart. I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that, I, you don't do this, you don't do that. So in the end, I'll come home and said, bugger it to the wife. I said, I ain't entering anymore. And uh, you get totally dis disillusioned. I've talked to people and they said, yeah, we've been exactly the same. Um, fortunately, that guy that was dem uh, that was uh, judging now has left. So we get, we get comments. We don't get personal. Um, we do get personal recommendation, but there's always a reason why there's a personal recommendation. And it's not because I don't like it. It's always because if you did this, you would, it would make it look a little bit better, in my opinion. Robert, my suggestion finish with bank series to let them rot in Australia. Horrible fibre things, thingies. Um, yes, they are, but they can look quite nice. But they can get overused as well. And if they get overused, they do look. It looks as if everything you've got on your stall. Is, is banks here. Oh, Pete, it was my first go at it. I didn't see anything wrong with them. <laughs> you don't to start with until you've, uh, till you try finishing them. That's only done Douglas uh, just apologising for not being either on the, to sign the register and uh, he's got a late mark against him. Mark Pritchard's obviously in the money. He's just had a delivery of wood from Homewood. Hope there's some nice pieces in there, Mark. I'm always a bit dubious about ordering stuff that you can't pick and choose. Two people see the same piece of wood different, completely differently. Um, some of the merchants that sell it, some of the timber merchants, all they're interested in seeing is nice straight grain. We as wood turners don't always want nice straight grain. We're much better off if we've got a knot, a crotch, or inclusions or something in there to give give it a bit of character. So I like to choose my own, I'm afraid. Um, I've never bought anything online unless there's a picture of it. And not always they do um, credit to it all.
Yes, they do, um, Douglas. They look quite effective. Um, the other thing I would say, if you're thinking of using banks here as a mushroom cap or anything that is um, flattish on the top, it's always going to collect dust. The ladies are going to love you if you uh, if you make them a load of those, and uh, and they've got the key from dust, and you've got to literally turn them upside down or hoover the top to get the dust out. You can, in all honesty, fill the holes if you want to spend the time filling the holes. But if you choose a red and a, blue, a green, um, someone's going to come along and say, oh, it would look nice in yellow and blue. So you never get it right. So um, small items that you're showing the outside of rather than the top of, I would suggest on that. So um, smallish nightlight holders, they work quite well on that because of the shape you you can taper them out a bit from the actual night light holder um, don't forget if you're using night light holders there has to be a metal insert in the wood before you can sell them or you sell them with led night light candles by a full up there by uh, full logs as well from the wood yard for me okay so you're probably getting a little bit of um, personal attention then mark because you're spending money with him which is always good Pete doesn't mind criticism of his work. Quite a lot of them, of quite a lot of it, I don't like. Weirdly, that's what sells the most. It's odd, isn't it? We can be hypercritical of what we do, and like you say, Pete, it's it's the odd bits that sell. We're critical of the finish. There's a mark on the finish. There's a little bit of a sanding mark. People come along, pick it up, like it, don't look at it in great depth and buy it. It's odd. But if that's what we can sell, that's what buys the next lot of tools or the next lot of wood. I see we've got the late grud coming in then. Afternoon, Andy. It's... Uh, Question and answer today, mate. Um, computer in the workshop's gone tits up since it's upgraded, so I'm sitting here indoors answering a few questions that people are throwing at me. A few suggestions. Um, so anything you've got, anything you want to ask, and he's a fellow club member, so I do see him fairly regularly, although we haven't got a club at the moment. Yes, you've got uh, you've got a mark against your name, Andy, I'm afraid. Yeah, the register was called earlier. Yeah, 40 minutes late nearly. Terrible. What's this one? My wife likes the oak bowl I turned. I wouldn't even consider selling it because of how poorly I think it is. Yeah, it's odd, isn't it, Hodge? Um, they, they sometimes see the amount of work that goes into something, and you know the amount of work that's gone into it, that uh, you don't don't want to get rid of it. Suggestions of wood to use for the the bashy bit of a mortar and pestle. I have apple, sycamore, eucalyptus, cherry, mountain ash. Richard, is the eucalyptus English or Australian eucalyptus? 
apple would be good. Sycamore is a little bit soft. Mounting ash, um, don't really know what that would be like. Cherry can be a little bit porous. You want a tight grained wood because if you're going to be bashy bashy with bits and pieces in the the mortar, you don't want the soft grain on the end of the wood because the pestle is always I think that's the bashy bit. Well the bashy bit doesn't need to be soft wood so it's no good making the bashy bit out of um, pine because everything if you put um, peppercorns in they just drive themselves up into the end grain um, so you'd end up with peppery whatever you were using so you need to think of a nice hard wood apple would be my suggestion out of what you put on the screen there as to use for use for your bashy piece and if we go even further back um, on the same sort of thing um, apple was used for the teeth on the big gear wheels in windmills so it's going to be fairly substantial and it's a little bit self-lubricating as well Another silly little fact because i can do that at times it's only turners that are picky at their finished work be it theirs or others tommy you're probably right it is um, we know most of us know what can be achieved and most of us know what we would like to buy um, and it's only a turner that will pick up a piece of wood and uh, without turning it over feel the bottom and think oh bloody yeah that's a turner there's a he's a beginner they've left the mortise on the bottom they've left the tenon on the bottom have you noticed how many more turning videos on youtube lately and what do you think of them <sighs> providing you take a little bit from a lot of them and think about the safety aspect i mean i turn in front of kids and general public 50 percent of the time when i'm down at the museum now it's no good me standing there without safety glasses on and get a splinter in my eye because that's going to go down well so think about personal safety first. Would you turn as someone is demonstrated, demonstrating? Anyone coming into my workshop generally has to have decent footwear on. I've dropped a blank several times on my feet just because I thought I'd got hold of it or it's come off the chuck and it's rolled onto your foot, um, not good. So I can't condemn too many. I would, I would say don't do what some of the American farmers, Canadian farmers are doing, knock a wheel off of your four wheel drive, put it on a, on a stillage and use that to drive a massive log. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how far you could be thrown. I mean, you'd need something like a scaffold pole on the end of your chisel just to keep it on the wood. Douglas has turned 70 slimline pens as fundraisers and given them away to a group for fundraising. Good idea. I do that a lot of the time, Douglas. I do mine for the, uh, the veterans. I will be sending some off after Christmas in the new year. I'm fairly close to the South uh, Southampton veterans, so um, I go down there and help them out if I can. I've got a lathe to go down to one of the guys. So, yeah, good idea, Douglas. What I would say is don't use slim lines, use streamlines. Same price, slightly fatter pen, and they look better. 
Keith, you're a tad older than me. Thanks, Pete. I'm already noticing wood processing is becoming hard work. Do you have any tricks for material handling? Uh, what sort of size are you looking at importing your, your blanks in, Pete? My bandsaw can take 12 inches in height, in cut. Um, the chainsaw can do whatever. I tend to get mine slabbed if I can before I even bring them home. I've got the van so that I can get uh, 10 foot in the back of the van if necessary. But the problem with 10 foot of wood, 2 inches thick, 12 inches wide, 15 inches wide, is just the sheer weight of it. Um, I'm all right once I get home. I can pull it out, stick it on uh, a set of traffle, uh, trestles and cut a bit off the end and grossly make it lighter. So, yes, it is. Um, don't go too big unless you've got it, unless you can cut it up outside. I mean, the last thing you really want to do is um, bring a, a petrol chainsaw into the workshop. A, you're filling the workshop up with fumes and uh, you haven't got a lot of safety if uh, if things do happen. And thanks for notice I'm a tad older than you, mate. I am 70, coming up 71. Now what's he put on? My YouTube ones are rubbish. But that is because I'm not a good demonstrator. But my ideas are quite good if you can implement them from what I show. Yeah, um, I think some of this is confidence as well, Pete. We all, we've all got our own degree of confidence. There's one, one or two makers out there, tur wood turners, beginner turners that are so confident that they uh, they're, they're going to hurt themselves one of these days. And I can see it coming sooner rather than later. And if they only hurt themselves, that's absolutely fine by me because I won't feel it. But it's not doing anyone else any credit because they're thinking they can do exactly the same as someone else does and then get hurt and then wonder why. So just just be careful what you're watching. And you you monitor it. I did drum into me that you are your own safety officer. You are, Mark. There's odd times when you think you're infallible. Um, I think we've all all been there and done that. Um, and then it's sort of gone wrong. Still younger than me. Yeah, I am Barry, but not that much. Barry's another club member, him and Andy, uh, two from West Sussex Wood Turners. But, uh, I will be getting in touch with you in the new year, um, Barry. We do want that uh, trench dug. Barry's my uh, digger driver that I use. He's, he can he can do things with diggers that uh, people can't even do with a knife and fork. But there you go, practice. Uh, if I missed any. If anyone wants to build a little bit of confidence in what they're doing, have a small craft sale in your own garden and I can't say invite people into your workshop because that's not a good idea unless you've got a massive workshop. But if you've got a little gut lathe that you can take out, put on a workmate and demonstrate outside, that's where the confidence comes from, people watching you. All you're doing, 90% of the wood turners are doing, is standing in front of a brick wall, a shed wall, a window in the shed and turning to themselves not seeing what goes on elsewhere. So the practice is well, at the museum, I'm behind glass. So I've got I've got people within 18 inches, two foot of me turning. 
behind safety glass. 27 inch pole was a challenge, but that was just a one off mostly. It's four to five foot logs, 15 or so diameter. Get them down the garden on sack trucks and start on the track. Yeah, exactly. Um, 14 inch bandsaw is a nice size, Pete. I'm happy with the 12 inch one. Mike's off. He, he hasn't got a full pass today then. Uh, thanks, Mike, for dropping in anyway. Richard, anchor seal or PVA for sealing end grain? Uh, if it's an exotic wood and you paid a lot for it, I would think probably something like anchor seal. But if it's something that you've won, been given, picked up off the side of the road, the local tree surgeon's given you um, PVA. It works pretty well. Thin it down, just normal um, builder's PVA. You don't want anything expensive. You can pick it up for, I think it's about nine pound a gallon, screw fix and places like that. Um, they sell it as a concrete sealer as well. So you can use that, water it down so that it actually soaks in. You probably need to give the end grain a couple of applications or even stand it in a, in a bowl of it. They're about six inches on the end. But again, on, on wet timber, depending what the timber is and the size of it, if, you're, if you've got a block or if you've got a butt of pine, ash, anything that is fairly fast growing, cherry, apple, most of the fruit woods, you really do need to cut it through the, the pith. I won't say through the center because the, the pith very rarely isn't on center. So if you cut it through the pith, before you seal it, you will watch the wood will cup from the, the straight cut section, it will turn up. That should save it splitting. If it splits, it's only going to go down a few inches normally because you relieve the stress. If, depending on the size of the wood, um, if you're going to PVA the end, it's going to be probably liftable. The other thing is after you've PVA'd it, where are you storing it? You don't want to lay it against something. It needs to be vertical or horizontal. So you're either stacking it plank on plank on plank with sticks through or you're standing it as vertical as you can so that it doesn't cup. So hopefully that's answers yours, Richard. Yes, we'll do Barry. Mike, Mike, Mike's off. Oh, that's what I said. I made my first few sales within the last month. The customer's compliments were a huge confidence booster. Yes, they are. And it's always nice that someone else is liking what you do. Because you, you sit there and you think, oh, I like that. You take it in management says, oh, what's that? <laughs> Your daughter comes round or whatever. Son comes round and says, well, that's a load of rubbish. So you, you reevaluate it, but when you can put it on sale and someone buys it, that does boost the confidence. It, it is good. The other issue that I find is what price do you put on things? As a beginner, you give the first 20, 30 items away to family. They get fed up, so you think, okay, I'll try and sell a few. 
how much do I sell that for? So you do a nice, in your eyes, bowl, let's say eight inches wide, eight inch diameter by um, two inches deep. Nice thick wall on it because you didn't know any different or you couldn't, didn't have the confidence to go thinner and you give it away for a fiver and the woods cost you four pound. So just consider the price of what you've paid and also what you're selling it for. And if you if you if you try selling it for four or five pound, you're not doing the rest of us wood turners any good. Have a look, speak with other people, do a few craft fairs or look at a few craft fairs before you start selling and see what prices they are doing. I'm unfortunate that I sell a lot from the museum and they are always cheaper down the museum than if we go six miles down the road to Arundel Town Centre, which is one of the big hubs of antiques and handmade in the area, and I could treble the price down there. But then they want 25% for a shelf for selling it. So it's expensive. So the confidence boosters are good. Um, join a club and get once we can get going again and pete says he's loving the chestnut end seal and pva can be a pain with the borax dip and kiln okay melted wax is good but is well you've got to have something to heat it with and you can't you shouldn't really melt wax over a flame because it can end up with a big bonfire otherwise and a faff to use. If you're melting wax, it should be done in a, um, a water bath. Uh, I can't I can't comment on chestnut end seal against PVA because I've always used PVA because I'm a cheapskate and I used to get it through work anyway. Um, but the end seal, if it's good, it's fine. Um, if we all use the same sort of thing, there would only be one wax on the market, one sanding sealer on the market, one of everything. But we're not. We're all using slightly different things and different techniques and methods of putting them on. Do you need to take out the pith even on small branches? No. Um, what are you calling small branches? because anything under six inches, I tend not to split. But having said that, if it's ash, sometimes it will self split overnight so that uh, you've then got to cut it down through. Um, but if you then cut it into reasonable lengths, it's easy enough to split. You can actually um, cut it with an ax, ax and a hammer, or a maul on the top of an axe just to break it through. Ash is fairly straight grain, so it would usually usually split quite easily. So anything anything above six inches, I would I would consider taking uh, cutting it through the pith. But uh, I don't take the pith out. Mark totally agrees with Hodgefold, makes you feel like you have achieved something. And I'm guessing Hodge was the one that he's a confidence booster with a sale. Yes, it does. It's always nice when uh, you get a sale and it's one of those things that you, you've had something in your box for two years, three years, whatever, and all of a sudden it goes and you think, oh, someone likes that. When we have club meetings again, demonstrating to fellow, fellow turners can be useful. I found that they were all very helpful and polite. Generally speaking, yes, Andy. Um, there's one or two that would uh, walk away and uh, say, well, what's he doing that for? That's not the way I would do it. But this is what I was saying earlier on. Sometimes um, you've got to have the earmuffs on so you don't hear what people say 
And yes. generally speaking, most pe most turners are pretty good in clubs. But we have one of the biggest clubs in the in the country. Our membership's 120. And I don't think there's any more that actually meet of that sort of size. I think one of the South London ones is 60, 70. I think the, the Kent ones are around that sort of era. I don't think there's anything that's much more than 80. I believe um, Mark Baker, when God rest his soul, when he was about and he came in and he said, I quite enjoy coming to West Sussex Wood Turners. It's the biggest club that we demonstrate to. So we try and be helpful. Um, and I'll always pass on a comment. Um, I think I've probably passed on a comment. Well, why are you doing it that way? Have you considered doing it this way? Not you're an idiot doing it that way. You should be doing it this way. No. Have you considered doing it this way? Um, and I like Andy. I demonstrate at the club as well. It's always a bit uh, bit daunting, Andy, because uh, like you say, there's a lot of a lot of turners there. Although out of that 120 members, I think there's probably a third of them are coffee drinkers, not uh, not wood turners. They come in for a social and a warm up. What are you turning at the moment, Keith? Um, bugger all, Mark. I'm sitting here talking to you. Ah, no, sorry. Um, I've got a 16 inch bowl blank on on my big lathe to do for it that's already sold that's got to be finished in the next couple of days and sent off posted off for christmas um i've just picked up 20 carrots to make for a, a christmas tree it's part and parcel of someone's um fun at Christmas they've got to be made and posted off to them and then I also have three shelves in a, a little co-op of makers down in Bognor Regis which is an hour down the road from me and uh, I sell in there so I'm making some small bits and pieces to go in there so um, I should be making a few small six seven inch bowls for there a few a few smaller mushrooms and bits and pieces like that cord pulls all the time uh, i mean quite often i'll warm up on a cord pull when i go into the workshop to do something because you all of a sudden you feel your tools after you've done something and if you do it get a screw up what are you doing you're chucking to cut quid away it's only a small bit of wood Best one, Robert, is when someone comes back and commissions a piece after buying a stock item. Yeah, that's exactly why I've got this big um, bowl on the lathe down in the workshop now, Pete. Because they bought one last year when they actually visited the museum. They took the biggest one on my display. And uh, they bought another one as a Christmas present. And I've got the second one as a Christmas present. Gav today has got to uh, escape. MD's chairing at him. Thanks for popping in, Gav. We learn every day and everything we do, good or bad. We do. Let's hope we don't do too many bad things each day. Let's hope we can we can learn and do them, do the good things and do the correct things or the correct way because wood turning as a hobby can can get bad and it gets bad very quickly that lump of wood that you thought was securely fixed that you just stabbed a lump of metal at it comes flying off faster than you can blink at times So self self preservation is the best one. What's Pete doing? Fifty more Xmas trees today. But Skyving watching Keith is better. Thanks, mate. 
we all learn things from watching others, which is why I want to do this. I want to pass on what I've learnt over the, particularly the last 15, 16 years of my wood turning to others. And I think the more, the merrier. Um, we all do things slightly different. Um, I do my Christmas trees completely different to most other people on on the YouTube. It works for me. I don't finish them because I give I sell them or give them away to kids to finish decorating or decorate. So I get the I get the buzz out of that. But I have done um, same size trees in oak, so they're um, three inches tall and inch and a quarter diameter at the base. Uh, I've done them in oak, ash, walnut, and finished them and sell them at uh, twice the price. But it's good fun um, and it's tool control. I just wish other people would think that the small projects aren't a waste of time. Robert Dolman's escaping. Thank you, Bob. That was good. Um, I'll see you someone else. I mean, don't know. Don't know whether that picks up very well. It's turned like that. Flat sanded on the bottom. It's a mouse. get the kids to make them. It's tool practice. And, the, and that is out of a, a three inch bank. It's a little bit fatter, but it's only about inch and three eighths. It's rough rubbish wood, odd bits of wood. And we all get odd bits of wood. Um, that, that in actual fact is a piece of pine or deal. If you're going to do this sort of thing and it won't show up very well because they've got a crap camera on here but um, the grain runs directly down through it so I've sanded off the bottom of the grain so I've got a, a ring on the top there don't sand them on the piss they look terrible choose the top where the grain is just about see it on the camera but choose that as a top sand the bottom off at an angle of about 10 degrees and they sit there a treat draw on a face silly little things like that are the best thing to do for tool control what's Pete put up I uh, agree with Keith and I was lucky enough to have knowledge passed to me when I feel I need to pass on what I can. Exactly, Pete. Um, I learned a lot through club. I learned a lot through um, demonstrating at the museum. It might sound funny and a bit tongue in cheek, but I was introduced to the museum by a good friend and he said, come down with me. Um, bring a few bits down. He knew what I turned, and he knew the, knew the caliber of my turning, which was not bad at the time. Uh, so I said, "Okay." So I met him down there, and we set up, got ready to open up, because uh, the museum opens at ten. And about half past ten, he said, uh, "Right, you're on your own for a little while. I've just gone up to the loop." Said, okay. Uh, what do you want me to do? He said, "Oh, there's plenty of blanks there." Um, I've only got cord pull blanks, but uh, you can turn a few cord pulls or turn a cord pull while I'm gone. So, okay. So uh, he disappeared. I was there on my own and uh, chucked a cord pull on, turned that. Still no Tony. Chucked another cord pull on, turned that. Still no Tony. About an hour and a quarter later, he turned up. I said, you rotten bugger. Fancy leaving me here like that. He said, you survived, didn't you? 
He said, I knew you'd survive. So I said, yeah, I survived. And he said, the, how do you feel about doing another one? So I said, well, now, I'm, now I've made all the mess, I might as well make a bit more mess. So, uh, yeah, I got dropped in at the deep end, but it, it did me good. So think about it when you when you say, I don't want to do that. No, drop yourself in at the deep end and, and say, yes, I can do it. It might take you long. I think my first cord pull I did down there took me about half an hour, 25 minutes, and now I can knock them out in five. Practice. Personally, I would find it very useful if someone made a video of how they process wood from fell tree to lathe, or can anyone suggest a good video or book? Um, I don't know that there is a video on on the tubes there there is a book it's an old one and i think from memory it's called processing wood for the lathe um if i can find it later on i will put up a link but as far as I know, there's no video because it would need to be time lapse over a good few many years because of the speed that wood dries. But you can you can paste together several different videos, small videos. There's quite a few, um, particularly American videos, because they have the um, wood misers over there, and they show how they use the wood misers, cutting it up into <coughs> usually two inch maximum thick um, planks <coughs> oh, excuse me because um, anything anything fatter than two inch tends to take too long to dry so unless you're going to somewhere like yeah um, yandles where they've got their own sawmill or stars and baits had that one um, where they cut timber mill timber for more more for wood turners than general purpose silly things make the most money my simple corporals make made from scrap or 23 mil or less yeah exactly Exactly, Pete. I sell my core pools for three pound fifty. Um, the wood basically is nothing. Time on the lathe, time making them. Well, it actually takes me longer to square the timber up, or nearly square the timber up, drill it all the way through, but then it actually does to turn it and finish it. Uh, and you get more more tool practice on the small things. And like I say, if you screw it up, you're only going to chuck it in the bin. Whereas you you screw up a, a 12 inch bowl blank, um, you're reluctant to throw that in the bin. You're going to keep going thinner and thinner and thinner, and in the end, you'll join the funnel club. So it, it does go in the bin. Richard, I've seen a video by Worth the Effort previously on processing wood. Okay, um, one I haven't. If you if you can find it, Jigsy, um, stick up a link, please, or post a link somewhere. I can knock out hundred pound, hundred fifty after cost worth of small items in the afternoon. Takes two days to make that sort of profit from bigger project. Yeah, exactly, Pete. So, and you don't get thought anything less of through making small projects, small items. What's, have we woken up, Ben? What are some of the worst items time consuming for making profit? I'm just making some Christmas tree ornaments, and although I'm making them for gifts, they seem to take forever, at least for me. Yeah, well, um, 
Ben, that is probably about right. Once you've made the first 100 Christmas trees and 100 Santas and 100 snowmen, you will get a lot quicker. Another thing is, what are you making them out of? Are you decorating them? Are you leaving them just turned and sanded? So many different aspects of it. Most of my Christmas decorations I make and leave bare wood. And I sell them and kids decorate them. And I get the I get the parents to say or say to the parents when I've when they buy them, make sure you put the date on the bottom so that you can see what they've done this year and what they did the year before and what they'll do next year and how much better they get. So yes, they do take a long time to start with. You soon get used to doing it and you soon get to the tool control and it's practice. It might be a green bowl, not sure. Okay. Not quite sure what that relates to. Problem with that, Richard, is there are several different steps, to each with a gap of weeks to years. Best bet is to write a list of steps and look for books, videos of it. Yeah, I think Pete's um, commenting on wood processing, the same as what I said. It's It would be a, a long old video. Mark Baker has written a book, Wood for Wood Turners, which looks useful. Yeah, um, shame he couldn't uh, be here to uh, promote it. That was a sorry, a sorry loss when we lost Mark a few months ago. I meant the hanging ones, the hollowed balls with finials. Um, okay, you, they do take time. And you do need a process. And what I would suggest on there is you start January next year and start making them for next Christmas. And then time constraints don't come into it. And you also get practice on the way through. I will, after Christmas, start doing a few more of my Christmas decorations. And I'll box them up. Once they're turned, you don't need to worry about them next year. And all of a sudden, beginning in November, December time, you think, God, I haven't got anything. I must turn them. Then you have to panic to turn a hundred odd Christmas trees. Do it in advance. Box them up. Keep them in the dry. Worth the effort. Is well worth watching and subscribing to. Okay, Steve. Um, I'll look that one up. I would put a link in, but I haven't got a clue how to do it. Like I say, computers and me don't go together, which is why I'm sitting in here today with the one in the workshop dead. But uh, hopefully we can get that sorted out. It's probably the update has probably removed a driver that I need, and it's not working. Uh, but hey ho. So. Have we got any more questions? Have you got fed up with me talking to you? Have you have you heard more than enough of my voice today? I haven't got anything booked, so I'm I'm fine to sit here as long as you guys want to sit there and listen to me. <clears throat> Sixteen of you out there now watching. Well, if there's no more questions coming up from Pete, it seems like today has been the Pete and Keith chat, chatathon, but that's not a problem to me. Pete just needs to get the confidence to stand in front of the camera or stand so the camera can only see his hands and do a bit of work.
Pete put in there. Making multi-part items like hollowed balls and two finials is best if you make them in batches. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, batch do them all. I do exactly the same with pens. Cheers, Andy. Um, thanks for dropping in. Your snow one will be uh, either getting dizzy or melting, so you best go and uh, best go and have a go at them. Well, Scott always clumsy, or did that come with age? <laughs> I'm uh, I'm not saying anything on that. What are the best tools to make boxes with? I'm assuming that you're thinking, Douglas, of smaller boxes. Um, and right. only, a, only a message. Um, what what size boxes are you looking at? Something like two, three inches diameter, um, two, three inches deep. If you're looking at that sort of size, you can do most of the work or all of the work with um, bowl gouge and a, true up the sides with a scraper. You can scrape them out. You don't need specific hollowing tools for that sort of depth you can get your tool rest in really close anything deeper than two inches i would think you would need to start looking at um, a small hollowing tool something like the simon hope is good that really does hog it out but uh, it's good so uh, Unless you come up with a size, Douglas, um, I'm, I'm assuming that they're just normal small bowls. What Terry said. Thanks, Keith, for making something out of your session today. It has been very informative. I have to go see you next time. Thank you, Terry. Um, I try to make even my turn in informative. I'll stop along the way. Cannot click clickable link but if you look worth the effort channel and the video is turn big trees okay um, yeah i'll try and make my demonstrations a little chatathon as well um, talk about what i'm doing why i'm doing it how i'm doing it and show it in maybe two or three different ways that's why i don't haven't so far done just one project like last week was two mushrooms slightly different shape if you missed it the first time you you can see it the second time the the ones i made the three ones i made all exactly the same turning basically but um different techniques to um finish them although the same tool was used on all of them different different profiles on them all um it's good um, the first one with all the christmas decorations yeah, it's just nice to bang something out relatively quick. That makes sense, Pete. As I was doing them as gifts, I was trying to make them all a bit different, which meant they all had to be fitted slightly differently. Yeah, um, that's going back to Ben's comment about decorations. Um, if they're going to be gifts, you're probably only going to give one gift to each person so make them all the same it makes a lot more sense and it's a lot easier in the long run ben um, if you're doing half a dozen as a a gift for one family that's different but if they're gifts they're probably one per family um they can all be the same so a lot easier to mass produce them mass produce as in wood turning not to uh, coming off on plastic jigsy has got to go now cheers mate thanks for popping in hope uh, you've learned something or got something off your chest douglas is saying four inches round six inches deep 
Okay, if you're going six inches deep, you will need something of a hollowing system, Douglas. Um, the small Simon Hope would be at its maximum extension at six inches. I don't know that I would want to go much more than four, four and a half inches deep. Unless you can get the tool rest in, which you should be able to if they're four inch round, um, that reduces the tool overhang as well. So think about the more the overhangs off the end of a tool rest, the more vibration chatter you're going to set up. So as close as you can with the tool rest and as close as you and the shorter overhang is the best answer to that. Trick is bent to make the finials different, but the mortise is ten and the same. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you're if you're putting a twenty mil um, forcing a bit in there to put the tenant put the uh, finial in, you know all the all the uh, all the finials need to be have a twenty mil tenon on the end to fit the mortise. Good one, Pete. Isn't it surprising how you can lose an hour and a half just chatting? Surprising how much you you get through. On, on little sessions like this. We did a question and answer at club one year. But uh, I was one of the committee on the stage answering. And uh, almost had a war in the uh, on the floor. I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't do it that way. I've asked you if you'd like to come up on the stage and, and show people how you do it. I'm not coming up there. <laughs> Odd, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh, I use my massive following tool. Is that what the wife calls it? For anything over three inches? Because I have, because I have it, but I also time long reach over the tool rest yeah um it is the overhang of the tool rest that is the most critical on anything like this douglas um, or anyone else considering hollowing and i wasn't specifically joking when i said um, earlier on the americans bolt a lump of wood on to a uh, one of the drive shafts of their four befores and uh, you need a scaffold pole to stop you being thrown across the property um, it's much the same for deep hollowing if you process your own wood would you not have wood at different stages you should have richard but um each species species dries at a different rate ash is the quickest of the english woods to be usable that can be as quick as a couple of years for a six inch branch trunk whatever you want generally speaking Woods dry at about an inch a year, which is why most processing plants will cut them to two inches because they've only then got to keep them for just over two years because it dries an inch in from each side. So it's two inches um, and, and a little bit for the bit in the middle. By the time they've got it on the shelf, you look at some of the wood, you go down to Yandel's. Um, Yandles particularly, I know it does it, and, I, and there's another one. Um, 
you see the species on there and the price. P.S. Part seasoned. So they're not saying it's fully dry. They're just saying it's it's part seasoned. The quicker they can get it part seasoned and sell, they got money in their pocket. You can help the process by part turning it to a bowl. Get down percentage wise of the wall thickness of the di of the diameter to the wall thickness. Um, we usually aim for about. 10% of the overall diameter. So a 10 inch bowl would have about an inch of wall all the way around. Yeah, we've already had that one on there. So what's the, I use the Hamlet Big Brother hollow and tool, it extends to about four foot long. Yeah. Can be used close in. Yes, the, the the big brother is quite a beast, isn't it? I've got various bits of the big bu big brother that uh, I've collected from shed uh, shed collections, workshop collections. But there always seems to be something missing. The, 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 it's it's missing because I've missed I've left it behind, or it's. Uh, in a different pile or in a different shed. I have had part seasoned that dripped when cut. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've been given a piece of wood, a piece of poplar that I was told was, um, oh, it's seasoned. You can, nice, you can take it home and turn that. It was already in the round. Oh, okay, so I put it on the lathe and uh, bloody hell, I had a shower. Once I got in, about an inch. Yeah, part season's about right. So the longer, the longer it's on people on merchant shelves, the dearer it's going to be. And that's one of the reasons why the why exotics are so expensive. They a they've got to import them. Then they've got to process them. And then you get to covered in dust because they're so hard. And you're sneezing for a week afterwards because you're, the dust, you're allergic to the dust that they've just get given off. If anyone's thinking of doing their own processing, I would suggest you look at ash in the first instance because that does process quick um, oak is probably the worst one to home process because it takes ages to dry that one's going to dry something in the region of a quarter of an inch a year if you're lucky I don't know how many people know, but um, when they did the, they did a massive revamp and rebuild and reconstruct and put some new timbers into the, the Victory down at Portsmouth, the big wooden ship. Apparently, and I can only say apparently because I read it somewhere, the big centre beam through that holds one end to the other is about 24 inches square and the team that were doing the repairs and the architect involved with the repairs they wanted to do um, dendro dating on it just to see when and if they could establish where that, uh, that 24 inch tree come from and this was in the square so it was all that hand hewn with axe marks on it anyway they they drilled in and they got to just below the center just shy of the center and uh, they had wet wood and that was oak and it was one of the original timbers apparently 
I know it was always splashed. It wasn't everything wasn't 100% waterproof with the water coming through, coming over the top. That uh, does make you wonder. I would put cherry one of the easy on the easy list too. Yeah, cherry's okay on that one, Pete. I would question that one though. It does shake and split very easily. Um, it's not one of the easiest to um, season in big lumps, and you also get the or got got the disadvantage that the worm likes the outside of it, the sapwood. So. Um, just be careful where you're storing it and what you're doing with it. Richard's looking at two ash trees in the garden. But I like them standing upright. Oh, such a spoil sport. I can dry silver birch by rough turning it and then putting it in the kiln for up to six weeks, six to eight weeks. Yeah, yeah, if you've got your own kiln. Um, it does help. I have micro, I've rough turned eight, 10 inch blanks and then microwave them for a minute at a time. And it's surprising what quarter of an hour, 15 one minute sessions in the microwave does for them. As long as you cook them, let them dry, let them cool, cook them, let them cool. Cheerio Barry, I see you've got some work to do. Someone else giving you a job now then. See you again, mate. Cheers. Um, yeah, providing you let them cool down between cooking, you should be okay. I know someone that well, I did. I did an experiment. I had a rough turned elm bowl that was pretty crappy. So I thought, well, I wonder how long I can put it in the microwave for and how hot I can get it before something happens. So I put it in there for five minutes on, my, on full and uh, come out and it was warm, quite warm. Oh, okay, it hasn't split. So I put it in there for another another five minutes, and it come out smoking. Yes, it's set light to itself. So you can go a bit overboard. Didn't matter because it was rubbish. Um, too much worm. Too it's too, it gone too far. So it was an experiment just to see what I what I could do, or what could be done. So if you want to want to dry wood in a microwave in a kiln, weigh it before it goes in. Weigh it when it's cold, when it's cool, after it comes out. When you can get two, three consecutive readings the same, you know it's as as close to equilibrium as it can be. And depending where you're storing it, if you're storing it in the in a woodshed, the atmosphere in there could be up to a 15, 18 percent. If you're storing it in your workshop, I would hope the atmosphere in there is between eight and 12 percent, maybe 14 percent. So once you bring it indoors, the atmosphere indoors is usually around 12 percent. So it's no good getting it below 12% moisture content because as soon as you bring it in, it will take up moisture. Good news is wood does grow on trees. Yes, you're right. So you can experiment with different methods and find what works for you. That is 
not only wood turning that is that is carpentry or working with wood um, certain methods will work for me and they won't work for you it's the way you hold the tool why I hold the tool it's the way you process wood it's the way I process wood um, we, we all work slightly different I had good success in twice turning apple with drawing in the microwave yeah um, apple can always be a little bit iffy in the microwave depends how thick it is or how thin it is apple is quite nice turned thin but again depending on the size of the the blank um, apple makes really nice bowls in thin a six inch diameter bowl two two and a quarter inch deep with something like one one and a half mil wall it's good turning practice if you're turning it wet is ideal what i would say on that is though if you're turning it wet to a finish make sure that you don't start turning it one day leave it on the lathe and go back and think you're going to finish turning it the second day it's all got to be turned in one one hit turn the outside reverse it start turning the inside <coughs> once you start turning the inside you need to spray the outside with water just to keep it damp but I hear you say I'm trying to dry it yes but you're also trying to stop it twisting and deforming while you're turning it so it's worth spraying it if you're going in for a cup of coffee wrap it up tight leave it on the chuck but wrap it up tight in a plastic bag um, spray the inside with water well it won't take long to get rid of the water once you start spinning it around eight 800 to 1,000 revs. So it's good turning th wet wood. Um, I've twice turned apple. I've twice turned most woods. The biggest issue is on the second turning is getting the mortise in the bottom because it usually goes oval rather than stopping round. So it's rechucking it but like a, like i said earlier on if you when you're cutting the initial mortise when it's wet just pip the center doesn't need to be deep but as long as you know where the center is you can then mount that up between a, a stump in the chuck or in the on the chuck with a rag on it and return the the, the mortise so that it, it's true that it's round and then you should be able to finish it all off. Okay. Does microwave and wood cause warping? Um, a little bit, but it's the drying process that causes the warping, Douglas, not the and you're drying it through microwaving it so the microwaving it does nothing to it apart from it it causes it to warp can i wet turn to finish silver but uh i would think so douglas Silver birch is a soft wood and the softer woods don't always relate to um, good second turning. Hopefully you can still hear me. I'll be back in a second. I'm just going to pick up a, a bowl to show you guys. So, Where is it?
Right. Did did you lose me? If if you did, I apologise. I've just been and picked up a bowl that uh, I turned a little while ago, <laughs> ten years ago, if not more. Um, so I can't I can't put a definitive on that one, Douglas. But I would say you could possibly. It's going to be a watch this space. Don't know how the camera's back to front. How well you can see this. This is Apple. This was turned, this was rough turned with a mortise in the bottom. Taken off, the, taken away from the chuck and left thinking I'll go back to it next time I'm in. But the next time I was in was nearly a week later. Well, in that week, you can see how far out of round that's gone. That isn't a camera issue. That is the wood. That was truly round when I finished it. But you look across the rim as I turn it you can see how much that's distorted up and down all over the place and if you look on the bottom that was obviously a round mortise when I first turned it and that has gone well and truly oval so the problem was I couldn't remount it because the mortise had gone so far and because it had gone so far inside. So I hand sanded this because it was too good to throw away. And it's not the best of cameras, but uh, there's a nice bit of ripple through there. It's a crotch. You can see, you can see the crotch in there. You can see the grain of the crotch. That's the way the tree was growing so you've got one one branch coming out there and the other branch going out through there so didn't stand much chance there was a little bit of natural edge just left there which i thought i could turn off but the other thing was i turned the the rim so thin you can just about see how thick it was it, it almost to a a, a point the overall thickness at my thumb and finger is about just over half an inch and it's just over half an inch in the in the very base so that's too good to throw away so all i did was just polish it up sand it up polish it up and it takes not pride of place but it takes takes place in the lounge so you can make make something out of really rubbishy bits Depends on what you are turning, assuming it needs to stand, make sure to undercut so that it stands on a ring and expect a different size and shape in a week, week or two. Yeah, exactly. So don't, don't turn wet wood. Think it's seasoned. Bring it in from the workshop. Put it into a nice warm house. Put it on the windowsill so that the sun shines on it and shows it off. Put it above a radiator. It's going to crack, almost certainly, or twist out of recognition. So turn it, finish it, or turn it and not finish it. Leave it in the workshop for a week. You should be able to remount it, remount it. You might need to just lightly sand it. Four six hundred, whatever, or Yorkshire grit it, and then finish it before you take it in. But take it in and put it in a cool, cooler room, bedroom, for argument's sake, which is cooler than the lounge. 
you should end up with a with something that doesn't distort too much unless you want it to distort like that apple bowl it's practice it's experimenting the same tree can yield so many different cuts and most of the most of the wood that I turn has got a crotch or feathering from a crotch an inclusion dead branch it's got a feature to it not just bland bunch of straw wood straight grained anyone can turn straight grain wood it's got no immediate character on it if you're going to turn straight grain wood you know, do a wane and color some of it oh, I read that one once I'm looking to make a miss a miss at the shape. Easy enough, Douglas. Turn turn something. Make sure you've got a decent foot to it so that almost exaggerate the foot so that when it comes down it's got something to sit on. You don't want too much meat in the foot and you don't want too much meat in the rest of the wood you should end up with it misshaping you can sand it and you probably end up hand sanding it after it's misshapen like I say the that apple took a lot of hand sanding I nearly gave up on it but I Every time I went down a grit, it got so much, so much more character to it. But I thought, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to keep going, and I kept going right the way through to the end, and that's in excess of ten years old now. Wife just takes it out every so often, gives it a polish, and uh, puts it back again. And generally speaking, that bit comes out. It's been to club several times. When we're talking about um, distortion of wood and bits and pieces like that. Steve Scott's got to escape. He's obviously uh, either desperate for the loo or uh, he's got something to do urgently. Thanks, Steve. Nice to see you, mate. Um, sorry it wasn't wood turning, but it's wood turning related. Uh, I'm going to give this another seven minutes maximum unless you come up with god knows how many more questions and keep me going um, before i pull the plug on it so thank you everyone for stopping with me i've still got eight in there listening to me rabbiting so whether that's the original eight no, pete's been here most of the afternoon douglas has been in a fair time but, uh, I can't go right back up the chat now. And I'd lose where I got to as well. So hopefully I've made it worthwhile. Um, like I say, I do apologise through not being able to do any turning. And, uh, watch this space. As soon as I do get this sorted, there is a possibility that if I get it sorted, I might I might pop in on uh, Thursday lunchtime because at the moment. That is an unknown one because Steve is not sure whether he can be at home and do a um, a live demo, or if he can't, he's got a video he can put up. But if him and I talk quite often anyway, so um, I could always jump in and do a live on that one. So transfer Tuesday to a Thursday. So it is possible. I just need to sort out the computer first. Thank you, Douglas. What, what is the strangest wood you have turned? Uh, don't, 
really know, Richard. I mean, I don't know that there is a, a strange wood. Um, can't answer that one, mate, I'm afraid. I mean, it's one of the strangest objects, maybe. Um, I've made three cremation urns, but that's only a hollow form with a lid. So, um, honestly, don't know, Richard. Um, some woods that I can. I like turning, some woods I don't like turning, some finish better than others, some are really rubbish at turning, at finishing. So there's so many variables in there. Um, no, sorry, can't, can't put an answer on that one. I suppose I could do some extra trees, lost actual count, but it's over a thousand this year. Normally it would be looking at uh, yeah, up to 100. Very easy and good fun, though, Pete. So just keep on going, mate. What's Richard putting? Have you tried brushes from... Bush, bushes from the garden, for example? Yes, I have. Um, I've tried lilac. That splits and shakes like it's going out of fashion unless you can get anything big out of it and i actually i turned a small hollow form it was about three inches diameter and about three inches tall i suppose um, finish nice lilac does finish nice Left it in the on the side in the workshop. Went back the following day, and there's bloody great big split down it, so it went straight out through the door. Um, I'd got some more, so I thought, right, okay, what shall I do? So it was fairly straight grained, fairly straight section of the trunk. So I ripped it through on the bandsaw, right through the um, the pith. I've turned, I cut it, then cut it down even smaller. And I've turned pens out of it. It makes nice pens. It's hardwood, There's, if you, particularly if you get a piece of uh, coloured grain in it as well, where it's starting to season in the centre. So that works quite well. Another one that I've tried and I had no success with in branch form is Berberis. Berberis you cut down and it's yellow, beautiful yellow, golden yellow. Turned it exactly the same as the lilac. Oh, this is a bloody waste of time. But I got, I found another big, biggish piece, not quite as big as lilac, but I managed to quarter it through the pith and it made um, four pens. Take, takes a little bit of time to uh, dry, but not too bad once you get it cut down to a quarter of the size. So it was only. Um, about an inch square, I suppose, with the corner cut off. It was not the easiest to turn, but it finished quite well. So yes, I've tried bushes. Um, heather, the heather tree turns quite nice as well. Um, but again, only four pens. Most of it is um, small stuff like that. Made magician staffs, magic wands from shrubby. With the granddaughter um, I've turned I wanted I had a commission or a request from a, a good customer she was only nine um, but she always used to come up we used to have a big hug and uh, in the in the workshop down at Ambly uh, you always come over to see me um, can you make me a wand Keith well, I said yeah what sort do you want uh, it needs to be 12 inches long and the end two inches need to be bent. 
Okay. I went through two laurel hedges at home and found a piece of laurel that was about three quarters of an inch thick, tapering, and it had an offset branch coming out of it at the top at about 20, 25 degrees. So, oh, I wonder. So I cut the branch with the offset on the side still. I mounted it between two drive centers, not drive points, ring centers. And I managed to turn it a bit and sand it a lot going down through the grits as much as I could up to the branch. So I made it quite smooth. So I was quite happy with that. So I just cut a couple of couple of rings around it and burnt them with a bit of wire just to give it a little bit of character. Um, yeah, that looks quite good. So took it off the lathe, sanded both ends, cut directly above the branch so that it was on the same line as the branch. So you didn't realize that the, the original branch went up through, but it, it looks as if it was all of a sudden a 20 degree, 25 degree kink in it. Hand sanded that lot up, took it back down there, saw a couple, three weeks later, and he said, did you manage to make my wand? So I said, what, this? Held it up. Oh, just right, she said. Lovely, thank you. And Mum paid me, so I said, no, don't worry about that. No, she said, you made it. So I said, no. I made it as a, a trial run. I said, I'm not 100% happy with it, but if it's done what it's meant to do, keep, the, keep um, your little one happy, that's good. And... Uh, she always comes back and sees me and she says, I've still got your wand that you made me. Budlia, it turned lovely. Did it fit? Did it um, not split, Richard, to Budlia? I've not had a lot of success with Budlia again. Um, there's so many, you can turn anything in the way of wood. Rosebriar is quite nice. But again, um, you've got to be careful. It's got, Rosebriar has got quite a pith. So you, it, again, I use it for pens and I generally drill through the pith and I find that works quite well. And it also helps drying, but I also re-drill re them before I put the, put the centers in, put the, put the tubes in because they always go slightly oval. Um, yeah, you can dry, 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 um, turn most things. So, right, I'm getting a sort of throat, a dry throat. So, as there's no more questions coming up, you're just chatting amongst the five of you now. Um, thanks, Pete, for helping me on this one, for being there and uh, feeding me a few questions and backing up my thoughts. And uh, I'm going to hit the off button, guys. And uh, watch, watch my channel, um, watch my Facebook page, and any as soon as I know I'm coming up, or the next one, I will ping it up on there. Richard, thanks for your time so much, Keith, and everyone, and all your knowledge. I found it very interesting and useful. I'm pleased you have, Richard. Um, that's why I do these sort of things. I, I want to pass my knowledge on to other people. I can keep it to myself and take it to the grave, but there's no fun in that. Um, you guys want to learn, and uh, I think we can learn a lot from each other just by chatting. So I'm quite happy to do another live chat somewhere along the line. If you guys ever want it, just uh, let me know. Thank you, Douglas. Cheers, Pete. So that's it, guys. I'm ending it now. I'll see you all next Tuesday or possibly this coming Thursday. Definitely next Tuesday. 
and we'll do the vases that I was going to do today. Uh, take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.